Well, welcome back to uh, The Unified Solution. And I've got to say, if ever there was a solution, uh, if you needed a bit of solitude to try and find a solution to something, then potentially uh, this lady may have an answer to your problems. Michelle Lee is about to embark on an amazing journey, solo rowing a boat from the west coast of America to the east coast of Australia. Now, she's been supported by Australia One in this because she is rowing in in part for our freedoms. Michelle, thank you for joining the show. I am just amazed uh, at this undertaking, and I've got so many questions about how you're going to do this, that, and the other thing. But first of all, thank you. You've come direct from the boat this evening to have a bit of a chat with me, so I really appreciate your time tonight. Pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show, Carl. So, uh, incredibly, you've done this before. Uh, you've actually rode from the east coast of America to, well, I don't know, Ireland or somewhere, was it, to, across the Atlantic uh, yeah. a, a few years ago. Uh, now, that took you, what, over 68 days? Yeah, so that one was from La Gomera in the Canary Islands to Antigua in the Caribbean. And it was a 68-day journey for uh, 5,000 kilometres or 3,000 nautical miles. What made you choose that at, um, well, can, I, can, can we say how old you were at the time? What made you choose that as your challenge? Uh, yeah, so I was 46, so certainly a late starter in the adventure world. But um, And it really came from opportunities where I had decided in my life, I'm just going to say yes. So um, an opportunity came uh, on a solo holiday when I was in Thailand. I met Tony and one thing led to another. Next thing you know, I'm on his boat and we're spending a season in the Bahamas. And it was during that time that uh, another sailing lady came over and handed me a book and she said, here, Michelle, read this. You will like it. So I always say uh, I issue a warning. Be careful what you read because I, I read a book called Rowing the Atlantic and uh, it plagued me for two whole years for, uh, you know, to, to just want what that girl had, the girl that rode the Atlantic where everything went wrong for her, but she triumphed every single time. And it was that inspiration that I just thought, I want that for my life. So I'm not the most uh, creative or imaginative person, so I just copy other people. Uh-huh. Well, that's all right. Did you, did you break her record? Was it even in your mind to try and do it faster or was it just a matter of doing it? Uh, yeah, for me, it was more, I, I actually did have a, a goal in mind and I wanted to do it in 55 days, um, which did not happen. You know, I finished in 68, but uh, it's good to have goals. And, uh, you know, the weather plays, a lot of, a lot of um, scenarios will come into play as to, you know, if you can break those records. But uh, for me, um, it was, you know, I was more inspired about the, uh, human potential and tapping into your untapped potential. You know, this girl was not a rower. She was nothing special. So I could relate to her. You know, she wasn't the Olympian. She wasn't the gold medalist. She wasn't, you know, these people that we look up to and, you know, we put them on a pedestal. Sure. And I thought, well, if she can do it, I can do it too. Yeah. And you certainly proved that you could. Uh, so you had the party afterwards. I imagine it was a hell of a party once you got yourself out of the boat and got your land legs back again. Uh, and then you've had a few years to think about it. And now, uh, because of current circumstances, explain to us, why have you decided to take on the Pacific and, fro- and, and try and row from the west coast of America to the east coast of Australia, which has got to be 14, 15,000 kilometres? Yeah, bingo. It's 14,000 Ks, give or take. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. So um, what, what are you planning so- on? Like, like, why take it on to begin with? Well, as we went into our lockdown, um, I, my just my mind went into flip out. I was like, you know, my the thing that I value the most is freedom, and it was impacting me. Everything that I did was being impacted, as as everybody else. You know, um, yep. three lines of income were impacted, uh, and it just really highlighted to me what I value in life. And it came out that freedom is what I value above all else. Number one, my freedom and my health are the two things that I personally value the most. And these were the two things that were being so personally impacted. Here we are being told to get locked up, to wear something over your face, to take something that you don't want to take. And just 
you know, the hairs were standing up on the back of my uh, neck with resistance and with revolt. And I thought, oh, man. So as I went into this, you know, planning, you know, I've got to do something, man. I can't just sit on my hands, you know. So Row for Freedom came to me in a meditation and so did Australia One. I did a, a meditation and it came to me that what I'm doing is my passion has become my purpose. And then what also was becoming more and more evident was I had to connect with a crew who supported my language, who supported my views um, in order to achieve this. Because, you know, I had enough challenges as they were trying to organise this during COVID. Sure. So um, to, to be connected with the people who speak your language became even more important as well. So, just, you know, a few things were highlighted um, and really brought to light the things that mean the most to me. So where are you going to start from exactly? Uh, I imagine around Long Beach, uh, uh, will they let you off, pa uh, what is it, Palo Verde, Palo Verde there? It's about the about as far west as you can get on the uh, mainland or are you allowed to go to Catalina or somewhere like that or Hawaii? Is that counted? Uh, you can. There is actually a professional race called the Great Pacific Row and that is uh, from California to um, Hawaii. However, I like the idea of rowing the whole Pacific. So not just the portion, I want to do the whole. And I love the idea of rowing home. So uh, I'll be leaving, I'll actually do bridge to bridge. And we're going to be rowing from Golden Gate Bridge oh. to Sydney Harbour Bridge. Oh, wow. That is, uh, yeah, every bit of 14,000 kilometres and then a bit more. So uh, that is, I don't know. My, I'll be honest with you, I am just enamored with your courage i have so many questions for you about how this actually works so can you explain the boat to begin with it's not your average tinny i'm, I'm guessing no so it's a specifically designed purpose-built ocean rowing boat and there's a about three or four uh, designs or brands out there mine is the original it's called the wood bale and it was one of the very first designs that was made um, so she's not the fastest design. Uh, the Rennick boats are the fast designs. However, when I built my boat, I said to myself, I want to row across the ocean, not blow across the ocean. So the difference in our cabin setup means that if you row a Rennick, known as the fast boat, you catch a lot of windage and you get a lot of wind assistance. So they fly, they really do go fast. Um, whereas with my boat, I've got the larger aft cabin, low profile front cabin. So I don't get that same assistance. Um, so there were times when I cursed my decision when I was out there and here I am thinking if I was in a Rennick, I'd be flying right now. Exactly. But um, I, I love classic. That's just also one of my you know traits is I, I love just classic. Yes. So I, it's just a 7.7 .7 metre carbon fibre um, by two metre wide ocean rowing boat with all of the bells and whistles that a ship has, although it's all condensed. So in terms of safety features, I've got everything a ship has, AIS, GPS, I have VHF radio, four-man life raft, seven forms of backup GPS, um, an electric water maker, an autopilot, you name it. These little boats are packed like a ship, really. A question without notice. You, you, you talk about an autopilot. In your situation, what does that do? Just poke your stick into your back every time you're meant to take a stroke or something. <laughs> I mean, how can you how can you autopilot the boat while you're having a sleep? And what happens? Like you, you go down for four hours, you get blown fifty kilometers backwards. Uh, this is just mind blowing to me how, how you how you deal with this. Yeah, how demoralizing, right? Oh, to rewrote the, the miles that you just got blown back. Yeah, so, and I actually never experienced that. So in my first row. Um, I never, ever got hit with a headwind and got blown backwards. Um, my slowest day in 24 hours was 17 nautical miles. My fastest day was 60 nautical miles. And that just comes down to whatever Mother Nature is delivering. So yep. if you're getting a fantastic tailwind and if you've got some nice little waves to surf, man, you're clocking up the 60-mile days. But on a really dead flat um, ocean with no wind, no assistance, and you're just rowing those boats. They're heavy. They're nearly a ton. 
Uh, they're slow days. They're hard. They're heavy, you know. Um, so we love the assistance from the wind. We love the assistance from the waves. Our boats are made to surf. That's what they're made to do. If you think of a surf boat that yep. our guys row in, you know, northern beaches, think of all those boats. Man, they love being on a wave. That's what they're built for. And I have the same hull structure as our surf boat. So, yeah, get her on a wave and she just takes off. She will leave you for dead. So if I was man overboard yep. and I was not attached to my boat and she picked up on a little wave, I will never catch that boat ever. No wow. chance. Wow. They, they're like a surfboard. It just takes off. Gone. So when you say you built this boat, you mean you built this boat. You know every inch of her. I know every single nook and cranny. I know every bulkhead. I know um, every little crevice in that boat. So uh, I purchased the plans and then we had the um, the panels, the carbon fiber panels. They were CNC routed. So they arrived like a flat pack from Ikea. Oh, right. And then uh, we appointed a boat builder who uh, we took the boat off very, very early in the boat build. Um, we weren't satisfied with the joins and um, the workmanship. Yep. So um, my coach back then, who was also, he was my coach, he was my mentor, he coached me to a world record in the lead up to this, um, I, I'm pointing to a photo of my boat on the wall, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> so in the lead up to the Atlantic Row, he also coached me to a world record, um, he became my boat builder, he was also my partner, uh, and so I always say, ladies, you need to diversify because when when something like that ends, man, you've lost everything. So he was everything. He wore every single cap. Yeah. And then um, oh, it must have been about six months before I was due to go to the start line, that relationship ended. So I had an unfinished boat. Um, I was shattered, obviously. Um, and then I had to, you know, pretty much pick myself up, dust myself off. I had to take my boat and get it finished. So I approached the men's shed um, in Borkham Hills, my local men's shed. I lobbed up there and said, look, I know I'm a girl, but, you know, you guys have collectively a shitload of knowledge and um, you've got the time. Would you take me and my boat on as a project? Will you help me get my boat finished? I said, I need to um, do the work. I need the guidance from you guys to tell me, yeah, yeah, you're doing the right thing. Yeah, drill a hole there. Yeah, go on. You know, I needed the confidence of them to guide me, but I also knew that I needed to be on the tools. So I did. I, I used to spend every other weekend up in Brisbane sanding, fairing, feathering, grinding, you name it, and I probably was a big hindrance and a pain in the butt, but – all of that was invaluable to my confidence in my vessel. Plus, it was also invaluable to me learning how to use tools, getting familiar with mixing the materials, you know, using epoxy resins, using sticker flex, all that sort of stuff. So when you're out there and shit goes to, you know, um, hit, yes. she hits the fan, I had the confidence to just give it a go. You know, I was like, oh, yeah, I know this. I'll just mix up a bit of epoxy here and I'll just rebuild this foot steering that fell apart. So... It was all very invaluable and it's all part of the journey. And I say that it's critical and essential that you go through some struggle um, during the lead up to, because that is what gives you that real mongrel um, come struggle street. You know, when you're in the middle of the, the journey, when you're out there in the middle of the ocean and you hit some low points, it's all of this stuff that you've done in the lead up that makes you think I am not given up for nothing and for nobody because I've worked so fucking hard to be here. So the low points, I read something about your uh, Atlantic trip where uh, I think it was a bit over 30 days in, you hit a bit of a low point. Mm. Uh, now, I'm just taking a stab in the dark. I'm going to say 68 days. You're not going to make it to Australia in 68 days, Rowan. <laughs> so if you're going to struggle at 30 days, I mean, obviously you kept going to 68 days and succeeded in that goal. Are you hoping to push back those... Uh, well, let's call them uh, Pacific Blues, uh, until deeper into the trip, maybe after the 60-day mark, the 70-day mark. How long do you expect it to take with fingers crossed, a fair wind and a good wave? Uh, so if I base it on history, so on three rows that were done solo successfully, uh, they were males. One man took 109 days, oh, sorry, 189 days. Another took 209 and the third man took 336 days. So I'm going to be in the 200-day uh, range based on the fact that those two times were in a boat, in a wood bale boat. So in terms of performance, our boats 
um, perform the same. Very similar. Mm -hmm. Whereas the man that took 336 days, his boat was a one-off, never been built before. It was 10 metres long. He had a whole tonne of lead in his keel. So he was heavy. He was like a ship. Uh, so you really can't compare my boat to his in terms of performance. Um, so I anticipate I'm going to be around the 200-day mark. However, I have provisioned for 336 days, just in case. Let's get back to the boat then. Uh, provisioning, I want to learn where you store those sorts of provisions. You mentioned the keel in that uh, in that boat being, uh, well, over a tonne or whatever it was. Uh, I would imagine when you're floating around like a, um, well, like a poo in a pond uh, in something like the Pacific and it gets angry, it starts throwing waves. We're not talking, you know, Bondi Beach, four-metre, you know, crashes. We're talking about, you know, 15, 20-metre waves. Now, you're not out there rowing in that sort of weather. I imagine you've taken up refuge in one end or the other. Uh, this boat would be built to roll, I gather. So you need to get used to being tumbled a bit. Is that part of the training? Um, so there's so many things you can't actually uh, mimic and mock before you actually, you know, lose sight of shore. And that was one of them as well. So losing sight of shore was something that I had never done until I'm actually rowing out from the start line going, oh, my God, this yeah. is real. I'm not turning around and going home. <laughs> you know? yeah. Um, so, yeah, things like uh, facing a 15-metre wave is not something that I even know how my boat's going to handle. Um but all as I do know is that, you know, the materials that it's been built with are the latest, most modern and the strongest material that you can use. Um, there's no stress test to say that, yes, it can withstand the force of a 20 metre wave. Uh, and you just hope that it doesn't hit you in a manner that it can crush you because it can. It can crush a ship. Yep. Those waves can crush big ships, you know. Yeah. Um, and yes, there are storm strategies on board. So, you know, if I am being chased by those massive swells, 15 metre waves, and if they're following, you know, I would deploy a drogue off the stern of my boat, which would aid in slowing me down. It would also provide some directional stability and it will also avoid me from pitch poling, which is going stern over bow down the face of a wave. Um, and then if I'm caught in a headwind and being blown backwards, I would deploy a, like a, it's called a parachute anchor. And uh, I would deploy that off the bow of my boat, which would hook into the current and at least slow my drift. In some cases, I think people have actually made ground, um, you know, if the current's strong enough. Yes. So um, then, you know, you've got strategies, obviously. And yes, my boat has been tested to self right So I know that she does um, self right If she capsizes, she will automatically pop back up. It's got self-draining decks, so all the water just drains straight out, straight off. Um, so I have the confidence in knowing that she self writes because we did those tests um, twice before I left. In fact, actually, there was um, my first self, uh, my first rollover test was an epic fail. So just like two weeks before I was due to ship my boat to the start line, wow. I insisted on doing the self-writing test. It failed. And um, wow. that's it. So, you know, and that was because it was an unconsulted change made to the plan. So it was a proven design. So it should have self right but um, there was some un, un, uh, unchecked changes made, which was detrimental to the self-writing. So I had to go and gut the gunnels and uh, bring it back to its original plan and then retest it because, of course, my nerves were shattered. Yeah. So um, I had to go and make sure that those changes were the things that made it come back, which, yeah, so she self-writes now. So you're not towing an ensuite, I suppose, are you? No, darling, no on suite on board. It's a bucket and chuck it, very simple. Yeah, so, so well, well, you're not going to be worried about too much. Even the seagulls won't be watching you after you get offshore at a certain <laughs> distance, will you? How, will the, how like, you're going to crank up the iPod? Or do you row to tunes? How does it work for you? Uh, the first four days of my um, row in the um, Atlantic, I actually listened to nothing. I turned no distractions on whatsoever because I wanted to get 100% familiar with every noise that my boat made so that if there was something a little bit peculiar, you could go, hang on a minute, that's not right. That's not normal. Um, 
So yeah, um, obviously I, I am well acquainted with my boat this time, so I won't have to do that. Although I, I wouldn't be surprised if I do the same, I follow the same protocol again. Uh, but I do listen to podcasts and this is what excites me about um, going forward and doing this massive journey for this amount of time is everything on my iPod is carefully selected material and uh, from my books to my, um, what are they called, to my, uh, what are those things people listen to? Uh, podcasts. Podcasts. <laughs> my podcasts. Um, just everything is just so carefully selected. So I'm just being fueled and fed amazing, life-altering, mind-changing, good, healthy information. So get rid of all the bullshit from news, media, TV, radio, which, by the way, I actually do not listen to. So I haven't turned on a TV since 2011. I do not read a newspaper and I do not listen to the radio. Wow. So I already don't have those distractions. However, there's the distractions of social media. You know what I mean? You see a, a fair bit of crap on social media. So I get excited about all of that shit being eliminated from my life. Yeah, well, you're going to be excited about it for a while. It's going to be eliminated for a couple of hundred days. Uh, will you have a sat phone or something you can call home with? Because this is a, a solo and unaided crossing of the Pacific. So that doesn't mean that anybody particular is going to be following along beside you in a boat. So uh, uh, somebody suggested to me today, oh, look, she'll just tie up beside her support boat every night. You know, they'll just uh, stay in spot. And I said, no, no, it doesn't work like that. Uh, so at night, whenever you decide you're going to give up for the day because your arms are sore or your bum is sore or your back is sore or everything is sore. Uh, so for you, is it just bring the oars in board find the sleeping bag and curl up and hope you wake up in a position that's further up the road towards, towards where you're going rather than, you know, push left, right or backwards. Yeah, pretty much. So uh, end of day is I stow and store my boat. So you stow and store your boat as though you're going to be hit by a rogue wave. So everything gets lashed down and, and you are absolutely diligent about that. There's you never, ever miss, um, you know, a night where you stow and store properly. And then uh, I locked myself up by about 10.30 p.m. I was very, very routine. Um, by 10, 10.30, I was in my cabin having my very last pudding and my cup of Earl Grey. Always had a cup of Earl Grey, as I am now. Um, whilst I'd you know, sit there and just reflect on the day, scoff down my pudding. It was always hot custard. And for a lot of my row, I actually had um, fruit cake as well. I took one kilo slabs of fruit cake. They've got a very long shelf life. Of course. <laughs> And um, then, yes, I, I just go lock myself in my little watertight cabin, uh, which is longer than I am tall. So I can lay completely flat. I can also sit up. I've got enough room to sit with. It just touches my head. Right. Um, but, yeah, it's, and I've got all my electricals in there. And under my bedding, I have all of my snacks. So all the snacks that I use during the day, they're all stored under my bed. Now, that's a danger because I used to crack into tomorrow's rations at like two o'clock in the morning. I was always um, cracking into the next day's rations. Yeah. And I actually did run out of those um, snacks before my, I ran out of them on day 55 in my other row. Oh. So, um, you know, they're so conveniently placed and you're so hungry. You just, honestly, you're just churning around, churning food like you can't believe the calories. You know, I was consuming like, 7,000 calories like the day. Listeners, Would you like the listeners and the viewers of the show uh, maybe we can arrange to have a boy dropped somewhere in the Pacific for you that just has snacks in it. Uh, <laughs> you can replenish along the way, or, or would that break the record? That would. That would. Um, I wouldn't be able to be classified as unaided then. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not even allowed to accept anything. I had um, actually, I had some private yachts. They were just doing the same crossing. They were just doing the journey, and it's incredibly boring when you're out there. So yachts look for stuff, you know, and these you know, a couple of them during my crossing at different stages they diverted their course to sail past me just to say because I've talked to them on the radio and they're like what are you doing out here you're like you're not even eight meters long and I'm like no I'm a rowboat man they're like what do you mean a rowboat I said I don't have any sails I don't have any motor I'm just rowing across to Antigua so they diverted their course and they're like what do you want us to chuck do you want a can of coke and I was like what I really want is just a roll of toilet paper because I'm rationing rations now. Oh, wow. <laughs> but I couldn't take anything. So 
Um, but, you know, they, they're certainly highlights when you have those little visits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, of course, in the days of electronics too now, uh, you don't have to print out emails, so you can't even use that paper when you run out of the toilet paper. <laughs> Makes it hard. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm still intrigued about the boat. So uh, uh, this watertight capsule that you sleep in, I imagine that you can strap yourself into as well because it would stop you rolling around in your bed. It would be, you know, that make logic sense. Um, if in the event of a worst case scenario, uh, you did wind up having um, some sort of cataclysmic event where the boat broke up, I imagine then that is going to be like a safety cell for you then. Yeah, so you basically want to stay with your boat for whatever it is floating. So yeah. while it's floating, you stay on your boat with your boat because that's where you've got access to all your provisions. Okay, so um, yes, I have a life raft on board. But the only way I would get in my life raft is if that boat was, if my boat was sinking. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so basically you just go lock yourself up in your cabin right out the storm, which I never had to do in the Atlantic either. So, you know, maybe I've been like lulled in by this false sense of security mm. because, you know, the biggest swell I ever saw was four metres. And um, I had a lovely time most of the time. So um, I do have a strap though made that I can put around a big Velcro strap, you know, like a cummerbund. Yeah. You know, you, you guys used to wear a cummerbund. It's like that. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. When I'm laying in my um, cabin, I can strap myself down if I feared that perhaps I'm going to, you know, be tossed around and capsized. Um, it's so a precaution you, I would take. You then just uh, leave, the, leave the boat set with an autopilot course. I gather that just keeps the nose pointed in the course or, or nose on course that you want to travel. It doesn't, there's no propulsion system because uh, apparently the only, the only sail you've got, you can only deploy at the back of the back of the thing as you're coming down a wave and you, and, and the only one you can deploy at the front actually sinks and goes into the water. So you don't necessarily want to get that confused at the wrong point. Uh, and that's why I don't do anything remotely like this because I'd be, yeah, very confused. So, uh, worst case scenario, um, what do you think are going to be your biggest challenges on the crossing? Uh, I expect it will be the isolation. Um, even though I, I know that I'm really looking forward to it, there is something about human connection that I learned on my first row that I did not know. Um, I didn't realise that, you know, it's one of those things that we, as human beings, it's a need. And it was the human acts of human kindness that I miss the most and human touch. So uh, I'm a massage therapist, you know, I, I touch people. So wow. it was, um, yeah, human, human touch and human kindness. So being able to make someone a cup of tea or have you fill up my water bottle for me, you know, something like that. They were the two big things I missed. They're still going to be my struggle. I know that. However, I have gone and done uh, a lot more in the, um, so that I've got more of a toolbox for the mental side of this. So I went and did a Jose Silva uh, method. I learned the Ho Jose Silva method, mind control method um, through uh, Janine here in Sydney. And I practice those daily. I use, there's about 12 techniques that you can use. And I know that they're going to get me across the Pacific. I'm better prepared mentally this time. Whereas I wasn't even prepared mentally. I honestly did not think that isolation was going to be my problem. Yeah. I thought that sleep deprivation was going to be my problem. And it was totally the other way around. I learned that you can get by on very little in terms of sleep. Um, I never slept for more than one hour at a time in 68 days. And I went to bed at 10.30 p.m. I was back out on deck between, you know, 5 a.m. and 6 a.m. And I got up every hour on the hour to eyeball the horizon, to check my chart plotter, to make sure my autopilot was happy. Um, and I didn't plan to do that. It just happened. It just happened that every hour on the hour, I got up, went out on deck. And it just proved to me that, man, you, you, your body adjusts so quickly. We adjust. Um, when you're, you're put yeah. in a situation where you don't have a choice. Now, if a yacht pulled up beside me on day 46, where I noted it as worst day ever, and if they had to say, come on, honey, hop on here, we'll take you in, we've got hot showers on here, we've got this, we've got that, I don't know if I would have said, thank you, okay. But because you don't have choice, this is what I'm talking about, where you get that opportunity yeah. to tap into your untapped potential. Like, it's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
I don't know that it's quite like it, like I'm about to explain it for me, but uh, sometimes just going on a long walk for me can be a battle mentally. Uh, and I find that I'm the only one I'm arguing with. I tell myself to stop whining and get on with it. And, um, you know, you find you've walked a bit further than you ordinarily would have. So uh, I'm not trying to put myself in any way near your scale. I'll give you the drum, but um, you must see, and do you take a camera? Uh, you must see some amazing sights in the sky at night. Even during oh, the time, I suppose, and that's the stuff you can't capture. Like that, you know, I, I didn't have the um, the cameras that can capture that. And it is, honest to God, you're just in awe. You really are. There were so many awe-inspiring moments. You know, the Milky Way, the stars, the full moons. I had three full moons in my crossing. Um, then the bird life and the fish life, the, you know, dolphins, the whales, like, it's just amazing are every single day. Are they inquisitive to the dolphins, the whales coming Yeah. Out? Oh, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it's with the whales, you hear them before you see them. And um, they're bigger than my boat, right? So yeah. they are quite intimidating, but it doesn't take you long to realise they don't give a damn about me, as in, you know, they don't want to cause me any harm. But, yeah, they're, they're inquisitive. They hang around. It must be an amazing experience. I can't imagine what the night sky would look like and running into a whale will, well, not running into, but you know what I mean. Uh, well, yeah. that's gonna be a, that could be a problem for you too. You don't want to run into the sea life, literally, do you? No, you don't. But you know what? They're smarter than that. Like yeah. they have, um, you know, the, the frequencies that they can pick up, the vibrational frequencies that they pick up in the water, they know I'm there. Yeah, yeah. What about... Uh, dropped containers that sort of thing do they pose a risk to your boat um look they they're out there there is thousands of them out there floating bobbing just beneath the surface mm. um they do pose a risk more so to you know think of your your, your yachts that are traveling at you know 7 10 15 knots i mean they're just going to rip their hulls right open if yeah. they collect one um i'm doing twos and threes you know I would imagine I'd hear a good thud and I don't imagine it would actually rip my hull open. So I just think I'd get a bit of a rude awakening with a, a loud thud. Yeah. Um, and unless I was flying down the face of a wave and happened to hit one, yeah, maybe I could, you know, rip the hull. But you just don't know about these things. When you say flying oh, down the face of the wave and you have such a big smile on your face as you're oh, saying yeah. it, um, now, now I'm picturing, like you say, like you see on Bondi uh, uh, or any of the beaches on Australia's east coast, our, our surf lifesavers in the surf boats coming down the face of the wave, everybody tucked in and it looks exhilarating. Um, you must also look at it as, wow, look at all this distance I am making that I'm not having to row. And if you happen to be catching those waves at 10 o'clock at night, does that mean you're going to stay out and ride the waves or are you going to go back in and uh, and and rug up for the night? Because it must be a hell of a battle to say, but I, if I just ride the next one, I'm going to go another kilometre, you know, or another 10 kilometres. You could ride those things probably 20, 50 kilometres in a night, could you? Yeah, look, the waves are amazing for um, clocking up the Ks and, you know, putting it in the bank, we used to say, yeah. um, putting the Ks in the bank. But um, for, for me, night rowing, I never loved it. And, um, it, you know, unless you're on a full moon and you've got really uh, great sight of the waves and stuff, it's easy to put an oar in at the wrong time and you can easy, you know, um, snag a wrist, a, a rib, um, you know, you sort of crab the oars. And so I didn't love night rowing. And to be honest, I didn't do a lot. Um, I, you know, yeah, I didn't actually do a lot of night rowing. Yeah. I treated it like a day, like my job. You know, my lifestyle at home is I am up at five, I'm an early bird and I'm in bed by 10. So I just followed that routine. And plus, you can't even sleep in your cabin of a day. Like, it is stinking hot. It's like, you know, 35, 38 degrees um, minimum in the cabin. So um, I found that my routine of just mimicking my normal day-to-day -day life was the easiest thing for me to do. I had some friends who bought a boat in Vancouver and sailed it back. It was 12 metres, so a little bit bigger than you. Uh, they took a bit over three months to get here. 
uh, they had sails and in some cases an engine. Um, but they did strike uh, an area coming across the Pacific where there was no wind mm. uh, for days and days and days and days. And doldrums. Days. Yeah. Yeah, the doldrums. So you're obviously going to strike those as well. They seem to be about the only consistent thing apart from big waves um, that, that you can find out about the Pacific. So uh, do you expect those to take a toll on you, the doldrums? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, because like I said, they're the, the days that you will produce the less amount of um, miles and yet you will be putting in even more effort. Yeah. So they do take their toll on you mentally. That's where you've got to dig deep. Um, there's something nice about them in that uh, with the autopilot, all she needs to work and to, to hold that bearing is propulsion, which is provided by moi. Yeah. So yeah. on those days, you're not timing the oars with you know a sloppy ocean or anything. So you actually can zone out. You you really can go in and have your little micro nano naps while you're rowing, and you just go into a, a nice little zone. And um, I, I know the beauty of that uh, through training when I was doing the world record. So I um, had to row for many many hours on an erg, an indoor rowing machine. And I learned that you can go into like a hypnotic trance or, you know, a little bit of a um, have nano naps and stuff. So I guess I've got to look at it on a positive note and go, well, they're those days that I can just be fully absorbing whatever I'm listening to. I can be having those little uh, meditative naps and stuff. Um, you know, it's all you can do on those days. <laughs> so, so you're going to have, a very limited amount of room. There is a very limited amount of luxury that you can take with you. Uh, what are the things that are definitely going to be on that boat when you leave? I love routine and ritual um, because they're grounding and they're something that you can go to when all shit hits the fan. You know, I find if you've got routine and ritual, there's just something like an anchor in, in your life, you know what I mean? Or, or in that moment of, you know, everything's falling apart around you kind of thing. So routine and ritual, I will have my homeopathic uh, first aid kit, which my beautiful homeopath, um, naturopath Molly makes for me. So it's about 12 vials of um, little ampules. And so I sit there at night, I've got my little lunchbox that has my homeopathic rituals. It also has my uh, cleansing and you know what I do for my skin so I go through this whole ritual that's an absolute essential item because it's morale boosting it's grounding it's just got so many things to it um, and then other things that I can't go without my goodness what are they um, <laughs> hot showers are lovely aren't they yeah. um, you're letting but, like a little uh you're allowed to take a little, you know, gas heater out there, a little heat, a hot water system. So, I mean, it'd be a salt water shower, but you could, you could walk. No, it. you know, I, I have fresh water on board. I've got a uh, water maker, an electric water maker. So I produce about 15 litres of fresh water every single day. Okay. Um, and that's electric. And then if that fails for whatever reason, say if I can't get enough um, power through my solar panels to my batteries because I've had four days of cloud, yep. that's when you start to switch your systems off and you have to become very conservative with the um, energy expenditure. So, you know, all my systems, my chart plotter, my autopilot, my water maker, my VHF radio, they rely on the power that I get from the sun. Um, so there come, there might be times when I have to think twice about what I can run and you come back to what are the essentials. Well, the autopilot makes my life so easy. So I will turn everything else off yeah. so that I can run her. But what my beautiful boat builder, Joe, has done, he's turned my manual water maker into an automatic. So he engineered a piece that fits to my seat. So my manual water maker uh -huh. sees me do this for two hours a day. I've got to come off the oars and I've got to pump it manually with my hand for two hours to generate nine litres of water. So what he's done is it now sits in a little case next to my seat. The handle is attached to my seat. So as I slide back, the handle comes up. As I say, oh, the handle goes down. And now I'm making water while I row. This is insane. The other ocean rowers are going to be so jealous when they see this. <laughs> luxury, luxury. That's what they'll be saying. So I've decided I'm going to have 
excess water on my boat, I'm going to use that thing every day, as well as generate my water from my electric one. So, and he's also plumbed in my a tap. He's plumbed in a tap. So I just hit the switch and the water just free runs. Oh, oh my God, it's insane. Wow. So that's what this is doing. Being able to um, look at the things that I really wanted on my boat last time, all the things that could have made such a difference. Yep. We've now put them on my boat this time. That's a, right. I've got to say that that hand pumping for two hours to get nine litres of water every day. Uh, how much water storage will, will you have on board then? Uh, because let's face it, you're going to be rowing for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours a day. You can't, you can't have the handle attached all the time, I'm guessing. No. So I'll, um, I'll leave it attached to my seat for about two hours a day. Yeah. Um, so I'll generate an additional nine litres. And then um, I also carry about 50 litres of um, emergency drinking water. So in the event that all my systems are broken, I basically then know that I have 50 litres worth of drinking water below my deck and I would only access that when I'm waiting for help. But, yep. you know, when I know it's game over and now I've got help on the way, yep. then I would crack into that water. So uh, I imagine we can't offer you too much by way of help and support. Australia won it behind you, of course. Uh, we, we, we mentioned them at the start of the interview. Um, it's wonderful that they've gotten behind you. What sort of support are they providing? Uh, so just through their members and their supporters. So uh, my GoFundMe page got shared across their network and um, they you know, people have given uh, generously out of their own pocket uh, to help see me do this. And, you know, this is in times of, uh, you know, we've got the floods going on. We've got yeah. uh, people that have lost their jobs with COVID, you know, they've no jab, no job. People have literally you know lost jobs so it's at a really awkward stage where um here i am saying can you help me i want to go and row across the ocean yeah. um but you know out of that i hope what i'm giving back to the people is hope and mm -hmm. uh, uh my theme is row for freedom which was inspired by everything that uh, was taking place and the uh tyranny that our government was dishing out to us and you know it was just something that got me fired up enough to say you know what my passion is now my purpose so hopefully by people coming on board donate or don't donate either way come on board and watch this you know you will have an app that you can follow and track me and um, get involved that way but um, um at the moment my my wish list is uh, my satcoms is um uh, an outstanding um item at the moment so if anybody wants to deal with Iridium, we might have a customer. That would be lovely. <laughs> oh, we'll see what we can do. Uh, you never know who's going to watch this, but uh, we can't send you out into the Pacific without a sat phone, that's for sure. So uh, who knows? We might be able to get the flying doctors involved. I'm sure they know somebody along that line. You um, never know. And they know, they know about travelling long distances by themselves too. So uh, I think it would be a, a, you know, a very supportive gesture on their behalf. Um, is there anything else, I mean, that, that you really need that people watching this now uh, can send you or how do they contact you, even if they just want to uh, join you or join, get the app down the track or uh, just give you a few encouraging words? Uh, yes, yeah, so through Facebook, I am uh, Michelle Lee or Different Worlds. You'll find me on, I've got two pages, as well as uh, Instagram. I am Australia's First Female. Uh, on Instagram and my web page, which is Michelle Lee Solo Rower. So that's probably the easiest link is Michelle Lee Solo Rower because that and will lead you to all of Just them. Just a great page. So many interesting things I learned on there about your crossing from the Atlantic too that just opened up so many more questions here tonight to talk about. Uh, I realise uh, you've had a very big day putting the boat together and you've uh, got, still got to go and feed yourself and get yourself sorted out, get your rest and go back for more training. Uh, I imagine you are not just while well, you're saying you're sorting the boat out, you are still rowing, but that's probably on a rowing machine. Is that what you're doing at the moment? Yeah, so the, because the boat's on a trailer at um, the boatyard, 
Ah, oh, poor Joe. <laughs> he probably can't wait to see me go. So, yeah, I'm doing um, ERG training as well as three uh, very specific strength training sessions for rowing. So it's just very specific to rowing. And I also do two or three uh, high-intensity cardio sessions a week um, in a group training um, situation. And, um, yeah, my ERG is in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Never far from yours. Hey, uh, you, you, well, I hope you'll be filming this. Uh, I can't imagine the mainstream media are jumping on you at the moment to offer you great contracts that we're going to, you know, turn this into a great story or, you know, we're going to publicise it because clearly they, want, they don't want you fighting for freedom and they're not going to advertise you for it. But afterwards, let's face it, by the time you get back, things on the media face could be very different. Uh, so, yeah, fingers crossed, exactly. So will you be filming this? And if so, how many GoPros? Can we send you a few more? Wow. Um, so, yes, I do use GoPros. Um, and, in fact, I only had I had two GoPros on board last time. One, my main one fell overboard on day four. Oh, no. So then I had to revert to my backup, which was just a little Hero 5. Didn't even have a viewfinder on the back. I didn't even, every time I point and shoot, I didn't even know if I'm, like, what am I seeing? <laughs> Um, so yes, um, I'm, I'm hoping that I actually have the GoPros supplied. I'm still waiting to hear, in fact, if that's going to happen, but um, someone has pledged GoPros on my boat, uh, in order to make a documentary down the track. So I still got my fingers crossed there. Yeah. Um, and what else? Um, Anything else you can think of? You don't want oh. the packet of lollies we can send? <laughs> Well, I've just packed my boat. I honestly have no more space in my hull for anything now. She is chock o block. Um, but I, I really want to say thank you, actually, to everybody who has come on board so far, everybody who's made a donation, and even the people that have donated their uh, time. I've had uh, gift in kind as well, and um, then the supporters, my ground crew. So, you know, I've got my race doctor who's just come on board, who's been absolutely gold. I just want to say a massive thank you to Adrian. Thank you. And also to um, Australia One for believing in me, taking me on and sharing me uh, amongst your audience. And then I've got other sponsors as well. I've got uh, an original sponsor from the Keys Marina, Richard White. I want to say thank you, Richard. Uh, you know, he said, if ever you're doing anything else again, Michelle, please come knocking on my door. And I did, and he's back on board. So massive thank you. And we picked up some newbies on the way, you know. Um, so Liquid Honey, Silver Method Australia for my mind, my toolkit, they've come on board as well as a sponsor. And um, who else? There was something else I wanted to say about that. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot remember. Right. But, but, yeah, just I want to thank everybody who has come on board so far. Well, let's hope we can get maybe one or two more sponsors. When does the boat leave? 1st of April. So it's on a boat. The boat is on a boat on the 1st of April. Yeah. And you depart for the west coast of America when? Um, towards the end of May, I, I would go. Right. So uh, your uh, due date in the water to begin this epic journey? I would like to be in the water by uh, June and then my window of opportunity to exit is June and July. So if you've missed the end of July, you've pretty much missed it for the whole year yep. uh, because of weather. So I'm just very weather dependent on getting off that continental shelf um, off the west coast of USA. Um, so I also have a marina over there uh, from Safe Harbour Marinas that's going to take care of me, Loch Lomond um, Marina in uh, San Rafael. They're hosting me. They're going to slip my boat. They're going to pick it up from where it comes in at the port. They're going to tow me around if I need towing. They said, we will be everything you need, Michelle. So, I mean, that support, again, like you just can't do it without it. Yes, it's a solo row, but there's nothing solo about it, you know, unless you have all these people that come on the way and offer their um themselves it just would never happen and every yachty loves a good sea story a good sea challenge so the, you know the, it's a great community the yachty community yeah yeah it's unreal yeah, i mean they must think you're insane rowing across the pacific but you know they're a great community all the same yeah <laughs> Michelle, I just, I, I am, I am so proud to have met you. Um, I think you're an amazing woman. Uh, 
so strong and i can't wait to speak to you again maybe before you head off uh, we can do this again uh, from the water side uh, in, yeah, in the states cool. i would love to uh, get a look at the boat when she's in the water and maybe you can give us a quick tour of her before you head off yeah awesome i'd love to do that oh uh, look I, all power to you michelle and if we can do anything here at the show just let us know thank you so much carl thanks for having me and congratulations as well because i know you had to move platforms so congratulations on bouncing back thank you very much uh, it's, well it's great to be here couldn't have been here without the people and as you're you're finding the the support of the people is absolutely amazing yeah totally uh once again all the best and i I can't wish you uh, enough success and uh, take some photos. I just want to see, oh, I can't wait to see the documentary. Just be amazing. Awesome. Thanks, Carl.